Hey everybody, welcome to the episode. How are you? Man, it's good to have you back in. Hope you're enjoying whatever you happen to be doing and wherever you happen to be going. Hope you had a good work week too. Hey, you know, uh, this particular topic, I will tell you, was really kind of a heart warmer on a couple of fronts. Number one, to get a question, which I'm going to go over and share with you here in just a minute, but also uh, from a particular client of years gone by that really touched me very deeply as a result. So when I got the question that I'm going to share with you, I, uh, I also remembered, I also remember this client. So let's get into this one, shall we? This week we are discussing landscaping design and creation for the physically challenged individuals. And when I say physically, I don't just mean uh, mobility challenged, I also mean blind. It's a very unique and done right, a very well thought out process before anything goes in the ground, okay? You know, you might be starting from scratch or having to modify your landscape to accommodate a, a family member that is has recently fallen victim to some type of disability, permanent or temporary. Or you may be a business, you know, and you're having to, to landscape for ADA compliance with ramps and walkways and automatic doors and all that kind of stuff. Landscaping for the physically challenged person is all in the planning. It's done on paper. It's done mentally, and then when you execute, it's just a matter of modifying how you're putting in some of the same things, some of the same hardscapes, softscapes, greenscapes, etc. Creating a navigable landscape around a person or persons or a public space, like I mentioned, you can also approach it in a universal design so that it automatically kind of appeals to all people in all different forms of physical capability. It all just takes a little thought, some or a lot of research, and execution. So, hey, I'm glad you're here. Join me today as we head off into year number two. Year number two. I am so, I'm so proud and I'm really looking forward to it. This week we are delving into landscape design and creation for the physically challenged, so join me, won't you? Roll, let's roll that brief intro, get into it. Hey, I'm Matt and you can call me coach. Every week I bring to you DIY landscape education, design concepts and theories in a hopefully easy to understand format so you guys can tackle projects yourself, get pro results that you want, be more self-reliant in these day and age, and save what? Save a boatload of money. Man, you know, after a 20 plus year career as a successful self-employed landscape designer, contractor, educated in horticulture and a retail nursery manager. I really feel like I bring with me a, a lot of knowledge and experience and I want to share with you guys, the new modern, educated, self-reliant homeowners of today. Okay, hey, delving in. First of all, you got to remember this is a, a public listening forum and I always like to be extremely transparent. So to start off, a small disclaimer. I do not let me repeat that. I do not pretend to be a touted expert on the subject of ADA compliance, or do I have dozens of landscape designs under my belt for the physically challenged? I tell you that straight up. This podcast episode was based on an inquiry from a viewer on my YouTube channel. Thank you to Meg B for reaching out and asking, quote, I live in an adult community and just have a couple of flower beds. They look messy though, so I want some easy fixes. Mobility is a big problem though. I wish I could give the flower beds some interest and cohesion. Well, first off, Meg, thanks for your interest in anything that I produce, whether it be the channel or the podcast. This video is dedicated to you and all of those who have limited physical abilities in one way or another. I will be honest, after considering doing this particular episode and topic, I was racking my brain going back over the last two plus decades on how many clients over the years I had had who were physically challenged, either in mobility or vision, that I had to pay attention to when designing for them. And, ladies and gentlemen, I came up with a whopping four. Four. The last one was Kate's. Kate's Lindsay. We'll just call her, we'll call her Kate because that was her first name, but I'm not sharing last names. The one, the last one was Kate. And if you want to have a tearjerker and a heart tugger, you can read and listen about her story in the ebook and digital course. 
quite moving to say the very least. So when we address this topic of designing from a DIY perspective, there is no better folks to be involved than the individual or individuals who live with or the handicapped person themselves. No outsider, myself included, no outsider will have all the minutia of daily living, daily needs and limitations other than the individual or the family thereof. But as a broad brush approach to the subject, I believe we can boil it down to a few key categories. I am sure there are more, for, but for the sake of the podcast time, let's take a look at a few. Also, Please leave a comment and add anything you might have with personal or professional knowledge on this key topic. Let's get started, shall we? Let's talk about the visually impaired. In these cases, I have learned to design around and focus on textures, sound, heat, smell, in order to define various spaces, front or backyard, within the, within the landscape. Employing these other senses for my client there was only one that was visually impaired. Employing these other senses for guidance as well as enjoyment can really aid the visually impaired. Therefore, special attention was always given to durable, safe surfaces of various textures. They really come into play to define borders and, and uh, approaching turns and areas of ease and navigation. Finishes in concrete, outdoor non-skid tiles, wood surfaces, etc. are extremely important when it comes to the visually impaired. That's how they, they start through the sense of touch and audio, that's how they learn to, to navigate without their sight. If a commercial publicly accessed building is involved, then, you know, please, by all means, I'm not going to stretch my neck out on the block. Research ADA compliance regs for a public building for the U.S. or whatever country you happen to reside in. But, you know, not all visually impaired people are 100% blind. Some have some visual reference points and can pick up light and dark, right? So, for someone like who's uh, suffering from macular degeneration or something, they have limited sight before things are totally taken away. When you're designing, consider things like landscape lighting, lights and brights of colors, etc. for approaches to front doors and doorways. Uh, all these kinds of things can really help a person that is losing their sight but still have something there to safely navigate around. One thing that I've I've used one time and that I have seen used on multiple times and that is LED strip or rope lighting along edgings and that kind of stuff so you can navigate safely on a nice good flat durable surface and yet they can still see especially in the the twilight times they can still see those edges so that they don't tip over in any way, shape, or form and walk off a walkway, they have that reference of light that's almost like a runway type of thing, if you would. Pathways. I always use pathways in visually impaired folks as far as wider. Wider is always better. Three foot walkways? Nope. No, no I never use those. I think the narrowest one was four and a half feet and then uh, they went up to five, five and a half, six, especially if there are in-home providers that also need to help these people. You have to apply the width of a walkway to how many people are actually going to be helping. So space, width, degree of angles, types and styles of ramps come into play and can greatly assist those with limited, limited mobility or visibility or who are bound to wheeled navigation only. Okay, so visually impaired. Let's look at another one. That's mobility challenged individuals. Space, width, degree of angle, and ramps come into play and can greatly assist those with limited mobility or are bound to wheeled navigation only. The style and creativity involved will be directly based on the person or persons involved. If it is a deteriorating disability, one that is very limiting now but might get worse, that will kind of call for a little advanced planning. Because if more assistance will be needed later, consider planning that out now, which will certainly save you dollars and you don't have to come back in and do something more in a year, two, five, or ten. Save you a lot of dollars in that aspect too. Another thing is, is reach. Reach and ease of navigation is very important. Whether it is in an elderly person with just 
physical limitations due to age or a person that's suffering a, a physical handicap like in a wheelchair you know again those smooth flat durable services without big drop-offs on the walkways or patios make being outside much more enjoyable and encourages those people to enjoy the outdoor environment without having to think about their own personal safety these services are rendered safer with non-skid finishes especially on angles and ramps you've seen a lot of it when you go out to commercial buildings and you have various grooves and lines and textures that are put in there so it becomes much more non-skid the widths of the walkways are going to be critical again especially if they're being assisted or they have assisted de devices like a walker or something like that you want to give them plenty of walkway space five foot minimum six foot is not out of the norm at all whatsoever this also applies and this gets often overlooked and that is if you're designing for someone or for yourselves make sure your driveway widths get widened a little bit both towards the front yard side if you would and maybe towards the side yard side whatever your situation might be but enough so where you can pull in vehicles and either the person can load themselves or if they're being loaded there's plenty of room out there to move around and manipulate sometimes our stock driveways the the stock 20 footers you put a couple of cars in there especially of any size and there's not a lot of room in between so the widths of driveways too lighting plays another important thing so that when people are out there in the evening hours uh, and their mobility challenged they can they can navigate safely around with plenty of areas where there's no dark corners nothing as far as the way of drop-offs make sure that your mulches and your gravels and your beds are very close very very close to the top edges of your walkways that way if they do feel the edge of that pathway it's not going to be a an ankle roller in a in a ground level fall that's just not that's not what we're looking for so when you're talking about lighting you're going to use things like maybe a few extra path lights wall lights i mentioned the led strip lights and up and down lights too down lights especially if you have lots of trees that you're involved in the in the makeover down lighting coming out of the trees can softly illuminate pathways all the way around the house and the yard not only that but it's also a great sense of security as well if you have ramps if you have angles of a tiered backyard and you have ramps that are going up to various tiers also consider handrail mounts as needed you know for support and another thing is rest stops sometimes people get uh, challenged with endurance and it's very very important that they have places where they can just stop and sit for a minute and plan your design out for special interest points of view focal points if you will from these little stops maybe it'd be water features maybe it'd be bird feeding station maybe it'll be bird baths maybe it'll be outdoor art whatever creation that you can come up with if wheeled navigation is the only option then one might consider raised beds and raised table beds for gardening enjoyment beds should only be wide enough for the person to reach across and that's where that individual measurements and stuff really come into play you know my long arms can go well past the two foot of a four foot bed but maybe you have a an elderly wheel bound chaired grandma that you're doing something for and she can only go maybe 18 inches or so so you have to do everything on a personalized basis table type beds that are roughly 18 inches deep or less allow for a nice roll-up convenience where they can be in their chair and reach in without that encumbering feet touching a bed that goes all the way to the ground makes makes gardening much more enjoyable for someone with limited abilities and if endurance is the issue maybe a walker or other assist device consider putting out sitting and rolling garden chairs to ease fatigue plus like i said before make those rest stops especially if it's a bigger yard make those rest stops frequent and in various areas especially if they frequent a particular part of the landscape make sure there's shade make sure there's water and make sure they have a place to sit down and relax and enjoy some of the efforts that they put in without having to hump it all the way back to the back door okay how about maintenance let's talk about that maintenance for me approaching this subject comes from the title that i came up with and i don't know where i came up with it, uh is minimized through planning it's all in the planning i truly believe depending on the the level of disability the the people are involved hardscape dominant landscapes 
in direct proportion to the disability involved is really key. Not only now, but certainly for the potential future. You use the greenscape as a softening and an accent role, and the ease of accessibility is very, very important. Heights of beds in proportion to those involved is very important. If you have somebody who's extremely vertically challenged, shall we call that, like Maestro, you know, and they're sitting in a chair, they may not be able to reach up to four foot beds very easy. So whatever it is, it's customized around the people that are involved in this landscape. Depth of beds, like I just mentioned, are extremely important. Being able to reach across and deal with a little 18 inch wide bed is a lot easier to reach across there than trying to scoot up or somehow reach across and try to get to the back of the bed for any number of reasons. It doesn't make sense. Now, if you wanna have a four foot bed, make sure you have accessibility on both sides. That way they can reach in on one side and then roll around or walk around and reach on the other side for ease. And if they have real short arms, hey, go three foot six. Who cares? Another thing is rely on automation when addressing irrigation. There's no hose dragging. Let's leave the hose dragging to the millennials, shall we? Automation is very important when it comes to irrigation. And I strongly suggest if you go raised beds, it is for uh, a drip irrigation application. That way, you know, you can put a timer at a very convenient spot on the patio or just inside the garage or in the shed. And you can do things that way. And it, it makes it so much easier. They can program what they need and it's accessible, but out of the way and everything is automated. One less thing to have to worry about. Lawn maintenance, that's, well, there's a couple of approaches to that. Number one is the obvious one. How about an outside service? Make sure you get a quality one that understands the situation. The other thing is, is you can tear that lawn out and do something like a uh, artificial turf. Or if you got a small lawn, <laughs> they got automatic robot mowers for that now. Yeah, check them out. They're online. They're really kind of, they're really kind of unique. It's like a Roomba, but for your lawn. All right, moving on. Vertical gardens. Great for small spaces like like a small condominium with a small patio. Vertical gardens would be good for raised beds or large containers. And you can put trellises in the back or in the center of them, uh, support them to a fence, or you can have obelisks that uh, you can plant various things on there that can twine and vine and do all kinds of stuff. It makes, it creates a lot of space for navigation in between rather than creating beds you can have containers and then go vertical and then have plenty of room to navigate in between. Water features. If you guys are a water feature nut like I am, a self-contained water feature, one that has a, a, a basin, a pump, a raised type of uh, feature that is up at eye level and can be maintained. Automation here is also really useful. So you can have it installed for auto filling and also auto dosing for any sort of algae control and insect control, that kind of stuff. Makes it very, very pleasurable to have and yet not all the maintenance involved. You know, when you, you consider water walls and vertical features with basins, the body of everything should be raised up just a little bit. Maybe you create a, a rack or a, a block of concrete or something where the basin sits in it and then everything is right there at hip level and then your water feature is at eye level. Lastly, on water features, pools and spas. If you're designing them, you're considering them, always consider them with ramps or even mechanical lifts. They have those as well. So what about that greenscape? Let's talk plants. I always suggested low maintenance, smaller scale, and to the taste and enjoyment of the individuals involved. You don't need to do silk flowers. You don't need to do succulents and cactus. That is kind of a narrow-minded view. Plants should fit the space and the skill set of the person or persons involved. Maintaining and enjoying the landscape, certainly. Don't plant trees that will far exceed the size of the area and have their propensity maybe of having misbehaved root systems that could lift raised beds and lift walkways creating a, a huge danger hazard. I'll tell you one thing, if considering sustainables, choose those that are truly dwarf in nature and harvests are reachable. Some things that come to mind are the ultra and genetic dwarf varieties of some of the fruit trees, dwarf varieties of like blueberries, that type of stuff. So if you have those in the raised beds, they're accessible and reachable, not only with the, the naked hand, but maybe a telescoping harvester. All right. 
Lastly, tools. Tools, uh, ergonomics really play a strong role in this, especially if you have elderly people where mobility is an issue and bones, joints, and muscle fatigue is a, is a real daily living challenge. Telescoping types of gardening tools for reach extension, the ones especially that wrap over the wrist and up onto the forearm, so there's a, a much better fulcrum there. It won't uh, fatigue the arms. You know, something I saw online researching this, and that is for those who are wheelchair bound, holy cow. Man, if you're out in the rural areas and stuff, they have these virtually all-terrain chairs, all-terrain track chairs that are safe for overland navigation ability. I was super impressed when I saw those things. There was people that were still in farming and dairy work and trucking and all kinds of stuff. They were able to go places I didn't think those things could ever go, and sure enough. Now, one of the tools that I saw, and it's not so much a tool as it is really a convenience, and that is if you have a, if you have a family member or someone or you're helping somebody out who's still not on flat ground, you know, they, they live on a hillside or whatever, they have decks, they have stairs leading up. I really suggest stair lifts for those people. And they have really nice exterior ones that I researched for this. You can go from driveway to front door in a, in a nice sweeping stair lift, which is, I thought that was kind of slick. And then if you have a place that's got second and third floor decking, you might want to invest in seriously you might want to invest in an elevator, one that can take you from a, if you have this massive, beautiful view on a steep hillside and your master bedroom is on the, basically the third floor and your patio is on the ground floor and you need to get down there, you're not gonna be doing stairs anymore, you know, consider an elevator. So, what'd you guys think? Some considerations for landscaping in and around someone with a physical challenge. I wanna thank again, Meg B. I really appreciate your question and you watching or listening. Anyway, for those of you who are uh, maybe a little more in tune to this than I am, I'd love to hear from you and hear some comments, not only for my own education, but for anyone who might be listening. Now, don't forget about our giveaway coming up in the month of July. Two free copies of the ebook are going out. Drawing date's gonna be the, the middle of July, and that's gonna be for uh, the book. And consider the book or the course for not only a gift, especially a housewarming gift or a DIYer. And the free consultation is going on right now by email. So think about that as well. Guys, I cannot appreciate your time any more than what you've given me here today. I'll be back next week. I appreciate it. Hope you've picked something up from this and uh, I'll catch you next Friday. You guys take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Yard Coach. Check out the original videos on YouTube at Yard Coach or email Coach Matt at youryardcoach at gmail.com. And hey, did you get your free 15-step landscaping project checklist? Check out the podcast description below for the link to your free PDF as well as the YouTube channel for more great information for the DIYer in you. See you next week.